Hello everyone, welcome to Uncharted X. My name is Ben, and this is another episode of what I'm calling my Ancient Engineering series. This series is one in which I want to take a look at the various aspects of and the evidence for forms of lost ancient high technology at various sites that I've been to around the world and had the chance to film at. And today I want to take a look at a place called Tel Basta, or the Temple of Bastet, the Domain of Bastet, the Egyptian cat goddess, if you like. It's a very interesting place. It's not as visually arresting and breathtaking as you might see in Giza and Saqqara and giant pyramids and all of that. The place is in significant disrepair, but there is some incredibly interesting artifacts still laying around out here. And some very clear signs of ancient high technology which isn't really a surprise when you consider that this is a very ancient place. It comes from the very oldest parts of the Egyptian timeline. It was established roughly in probably the second dynasty, but it remained active right up until the end, or it was important right up until the end of the Greek Roman period. So for more than 3000 years, this site was here and it's more or less been pillaged and quarried ever since. It's not a place that gets visited very often by tourists or by anybody else really. It's actually located a fair way out of the city. It's 80 kilometers to the northeast of Cairo, uh, close to the uh, modern city of Zagazig, which is awesome just because it's called Zagazig. There's a part of me that kind of wishes they zigged where they zagged and it was called Zigazag, but maybe that's just me. Uh, getting there is kind of a trip. You do have to typically, as in Egypt, depending where you're going, have an armed escort, which is certainly something we did in this case. Uh, as you can see from this driving footage, we're following one of the ubiquitous Toyotas with a load of bros with AKs in it. It does take about three or four hours to get there, even though it's 80 kilometers, but that's pretty much uh, par for the course when you're going anywhere in Egypt. So I want this series to be a little less in depth and not as long. That's my forever goal is to make short videos. We'll see how I go. Ultimately, I really want to instill in people the sense of mystery and wonder that's still available to see on these sites. But I don't want to presume that people have actually watched my content before. So I do want to give a little bit of background as to why I think the true history of these places goes back much further than we give them credit for. So if you know what I'm going to say here or you've heard it from me before, feel free to skip ahead to where I start talking about the site itself, which is in roughly four minutes from now. now. This is a generalization, but that's unavoidable when you're looking at big pictures, and of course there are always exceptions. But in general, mainstream academics and Egyptologists, the people that hold the authority over the official stories of places like this, they would all more or less have you believe that it's just the product of one civilization. And while it was a great civilization, the ancient Egyptian civilization, it was a relatively primitive civilization, certainly in comparison to us. And that everything you see on the sites that are left to us were all created at one time and in one place. And that all of the mysteries and questions that are raised about these places have effectively been solved. There's nothing to see here. We know how it all happened. However, when you take a closer look, and in particular when you widen your perspective of the past, there's often much more than initially meets the eye. And that's a f***ing plane going over her head. Now, undoubtedly and most certainly, this was an ancient Egyptian site. And those same scholars, they have done just a bang-up job of understanding that civilization and that culture. The question really is, did the ancient Egyptians inherit a stack of their loot and their architecture and even their culture from some lost ancient high-technology civilization? I think there's a very good chance that they did, in fact, do so. And mostly, that's also what the Egyptians themselves said. Our scholars just wave a hand and say, well, that's just their myths, it's not their history. While the ancients themselves really made no such distinction. They called their ancient times Zeptepi, the time of the gods. They draw their own lineage back to this time, and it goes back many, many thousands of years before our own concept of history even begins. They describe themselves as a legacy civilization, and by definition, legacy civilizations inherit things from their precursors, be it culture, architecture, or artifacts. This concept is also evidenced by at least two clear levels of technology that are still on display at many of the sites that are left to us, in particular the Old Kingdom sites, which are the oldest parts of the Egyptian civilization that, allegedly at least, emerged directly from the Stone Age. The evidence for a lost ancient high technology civilization that preceded this time is only getting stronger, and I think that's really the most likely explanation for what we see here. There is considerable reasoning and evidence behind this concept, not just the technology on display and the stonework, but things like contradictions in the official stories, one of my favorites. How are these things the first damn pyramids that Egypt ever built? 
Uh, how did they quarry and build stuff like this, doing things like that? This is how they made them, apparently. Mm-hmm. Watch out your break -ins. <laughs> There's also an awful lot of new science that's emerged in the last 20 years that shows all of the nasty, nasty things that happened at the end of the last ice age, namely cataclysms, cosmic impacts, megafaunal extinctions, and really unimaginable flooding and fire that changed the entire surface of the Earth. Now this rough day happened roughly 13,000 years ago, which when you combine that with more new science that happens to extend the human timeline to around 300,000 years old, so well and truly before this cataclysm, perhaps even longer, also the simple fact that our own concept of civilization and history only begins several thousand years after this massive cataclysm, the case just gets stronger and stronger. Humans being humans, after all, give us nice warm weather, some stuff to eat, and our brains start to automatically do things like problem solving and language. We organize, damn it. Otherwise the chimps would have figured out by now that they could straight up rip our arms out when it came down to just grappling in the jungle. So I expound on these topics at great length in some of my other videos, and God knows that I'm quite a windy bugger. So if you want to check those out, the links are below. What I'd like to do now is focus specifically on the Temple of Bastet and what we can go and see on this site today. When you get to Tel Basta, it's not as visually stunning as many of the other Egyptian sites. There aren't any giant structures still left standing here. In fact, I'd best describe this place as kind of a granite graveyard, if you like. It's almost a strewn field of rubble that's left lying around. However, it's some very interesting rubble. It's the remains of what must have been an absolutely magnificent structure or set of structures. It wasn't a pyramid so much as, I guess, a temple would be the descriptive term, but an absolutely massive construction. I've heard people say that this was perhaps a, even a kilometer long, like just a giant, giant structure that stood in place for more than 3,000 years. It's essentially termed an open-air museum, and there's been some very nice renovation work done by the Egyptians, although I can't say that the workmanship is quite up to the quality that it was in the old days. There's still plenty to see here when you go digging around the site. As I've said, you do tend to see two different types of technology or two different levels of technology in evidence on these sites, particularly Old Kingdom sites like this one. One level being quite primitive, obviously done by hand and with hand tools. For example, this piece here, which looks like it could be a carving of Hathor. Or for example, another piece here, this granite carving looks like it's a granite tefnut. And these are often sitting right next to other objects that display an entirely different level of technology. A high degree of precision in the stone surfaces, a high degree of technology that's evident in the carving and in the finished surfaces. For example, this box or this rounded coffer, it reminds me of the box that they found at the bottom of the Great Pit of Zaywat El Aran. It's obviously quite precise in its manufacture. It has nice smooth surfaces. It has some very strange indentations on the bottom of the box that scream to me of some sort of functionality. After all, why would you bother trying to carve a whole series of 90 degree turns and make your life difficult, which is obviously what's happened here, unless you had a functional reason to do so. A quick side note here concerning geopolymers, which many people have suggested in the comments section to me as potentially a source of manufacturing of some of the high technology objects like boxes. You can see here the natural coloring in the stone and in this box, that was part of the original rock and part of the layers of strata as it was quarried. You see the same thing on boxes in the Serapium. And I think that's one of the main reasons why these aren't a geopolymer formed object. Geopolymers wouldn't work that way. You wouldn't have these types of coloring differences if it was just a poured slurry. It's not to say that geopolymers aren't the case for places like Pumapunku, Tiwanaku. I think there's a strong case to be made there, and I know there's been some research done in that direction. But I don't think it's the source for a lot of the granite objects that you see. And then there's this thing, which I think is the absolute highlight of this site. When I first saw this, my, my jaw hit the floor. It's absolutely incredible. I think Yusuf's expression kind of tells the tale. This is the end piece of a granite column that has broken off when it fell down or at some point in its past. It's just mind-blowingly amazing. I, I, I really don't know what to say about it. The precision that's evident in it, the surface finishing, the symmetry of all of the carvings, the fine detail that's put into this. It's shaped like a lotus flower. All of these granite columns, and there's not like they're, they're rare or anything. These things are on a lot of the different sites. They really boggle the mind. They're all carved from single pieces of just what must have been massive chunks of granite. 
the fact that they narrow down before they flare out at the end means that the entire piece must have been as wide or wider than the lotus flowered flared end. You make a single mistake trying to carve anything on this, you pretty much have to scrap it and start again. Yet it's perfectly symmetrical, it's perfectly sharp in its angles, and it's just... I don't understand how anybody could ever tell you these things were made by hand. And they're not small. Some of these columns, they're, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet long. There's huge examples of these at Tanis, at Alexandria, just gigantic. This is a, you can see the other pieces of it over here, which are broken off. Also just giant chunks of granite. We often think of columns as being part of Greek or Roman architecture, and there's some real significant differences between the Egyptian columns and Greek and Roman columns. For one, the Greek and Roman columns are typically made out of marble or much softer stone than granite. Granite's incredibly hard relative to marble. And mostly with Greek and Roman style columns, you have effectively a series of stacked up rounds. So they would make round pieces and then stack them up end over end. Here are some other examples of this exact same type of column that are at the side of Tanis, which also involves some dudes with AKs. And this is also where we get into one of the absolutely massive contradictions in the official story of the history of dynastic Egypt. According to archaeologists, Egyptologists, the people that have the authority over the story, ancient Egyptians did not have the ability to quarry this type of stone in the Old Kingdom. They only developed that capability later on. This is according to their interpretation of the ancient Egyptians themselves. Doesn't make any sense, does it? They say that columns like this, the boxes, the giant stones in the Great Pyramid, all of the granite, that was all quarried from bits and pieces of rock that they just found laying around. It really doesn't make any sense at all. You have columns like this at Giza. There are columns that were all part of the surrounding architecture around the pyramids. 16 identical columns were found at Giza. Just imagine the difficulty in actually creating 16 identical columns that look like this. You can't actually find pieces of granite like this on the surface or just laying around to find a piece this solid that you can carve into something this big without any defects. You often have to dig down to the core granite the granite that's under the surface in the quarry, sometimes meters deep. It's patently obvious that the people who made these columns and who made the high technology precise granite objects of the Old Kingdom did have the ability to quarry. They obviously had the ability to make precision objects like this because that's what we're looking at. If you consider the idea that these objects were inherited from an earlier time, the entire picture starts to make a bit more sense. Here's Yusuf Aywan, an expert guide, also a accomplished stonemason, musician, and a friend of mine, talking a little bit about it. They believed also, again, I'm saying this because I don't believe it. They believed that the old kingdom didn't hack, or the, the pyramid builders didn't hack, didn't quarry from the mother rock, and they depended on falling pieces and stuff like that. I think this is a big mistake. Definitely, they worked from the core, the quality of the granite stone especially is, you know, not like the surface ones. The surface ones are crumbling. Second, the, 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 the results of like 16 pillars, all the same measurements, no extensions and things like that. This reflects that those who were carving these stones, they have a total power. They have control. They, they want to accomplish something, they accomplish it all the same measurement. You know how challenging is this? Pillars that's over five and a half meters. Where do you find 16 pillars? Like, you know, 16 pieces yeah. that you can make 16 pillars out of. The crown is a single solid piece with the pillar, not like the Roman pillars. Made, up. Yeah, yeah. The pillars in the pyramid structures are single solid piece. That palm-shaped pillar is very, very challenging. Of course, the piece itself was as big as the width of, of the, the crown, of the palm, of the crown, yeah, of the pillar. And then the base of it is wide, and then it keeps going narrower, narrower, narrower like this, and then the pillar is crowned as on top. Very, very, very challenging. You can find it in the sites that's dated on the related to the fifth dynasty especially and um, that's of course according to the writing even that we saw pillars from Winnie's structure the that pyramid and from that uh, open court of it and 
uh, still has crude writings on the pillars, but that's how they were dated and related. The writings look so crude, doesn't fit with somebody who have the capability of creating a three-dimensional piece of art class, and then he will do the writings this poor. Don't tell me that they run out of time or something like that, or tools. Hmm? In previous videos, I've made the case that seeing relatively low technology writing or even crude writing on what is a clearly high technology object is a good sign that that object's actually been inherited by the ancient Egyptians and then written on at some later date. And there's actually a really good example of that here at Bastet. You can see that the object itself, in this case, I think it's a, either a piece of a wall or a column made out of some form of black granite, has a very smooth finish. It's a very flat surface, and this was probably polished at some point. You commonly see this across statues and boxes and those types of things. And from those objects, we know that the builders were certainly capable of polishing any indentation or curve or surface in the stone. Yet the writing, if you look at it closely, was obviously made by hand tools. It leaves tool marks. And anywhere where there's an interior surface to the illustrations, you can see is not actually polished. So this is a pretty clear indication to me that the writing was added at some later date and it was added with a different level of technology than was used to make the object itself. But where are the tools? And that's the mystery. Where are the tools hmm, that can accomplish this? We found copper chisels. So we want to give any explanation that can make the copper chisel be able somehow to carve a granite. Forget it. There is another tool that you don't know about, that we don't know about. And we see some results of it. Some results of powerful tools like tubular drills and circular saw, so, you know? There are quite a few machine tool marks to be found at the Temple of Bastet. You might have noticed one already on the block with the writing. It looks like what is to me a circular saw mark or a some sort of cutting tool mark. And here's another saw mark into a piece of rose granite. There are a whole number of tubular drill marks on various blocks littered around this place, including this example, which is a really cool block. On one side, you have a tubular drill mark with just some beautiful striations showing you just how powerful this tool was. And on the other side of the block is a key lock system. We actually had the chance to compare these ancient drill holes to some more modern drill holes that were drilled into pieces of granite for various reasons. Like you can see the modern drill holes just don't have the same striation marks and they have a whole different profile. In fact, some of the tool tips that you can see from the modern drills, which I presume are diamond tipped and you know have power tools driving them, are actually wider than the tools that we used to really push into the granite in the ancient tool marks. In any case, it's a very interesting site. There are indications of ancient high technology all over the place. And the spectacular column is one of my favorite pieces across all of Egypt, to be honest. So I hope you enjoyed that. You can check out all of my videos on my channel or on my website, unchartedx.com. And if you like what I'm doing and would like to help me do it a little more, you can find details for that at unchartedx.com support. And I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.